Okay, in the interest of time, uh, we are going to go ahead and get started, but I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar hosted by Caring.com with our special guest, Kent Lewis. We're really excited to share an exciting presentation on customer and employee retention through implementing a culture of caring. As we begin, I just want to cover a few housekeeping items for today's webinar. This is a one-way webcast, meaning only Kent and myself will have video and audio throughout today's presentation. However, we still want to hear from you. At any point throughout the webinar, you can submit your questions using the Q&A section within Zoom or the chat. We're going to be answering those questions live following the presentation. One of the most common questions we get asked is, will this be recorded? The answer is yes. We are recording today's presentation, and we plan to distribute both the recording and the slides over the next couple of days. This free webinar is brought to you by Caring.com. Now, for those of you joining who may be less familiar, Caring is a leading online resource for senior living and senior care. Our organization was founded by caregivers for caregivers. Our flagship website, Caring.com, was created and launched in 2007 to equip family caregivers to make better decisions, save time, money, and feel less alone. Today, we have a portfolio of websites and referral services that millions of people use to research senior living and senior care. And thousands of senior living communities and home care agencies partner with Caring to reach our target audience who are actively looking for online for care solutions. So before we get started, I just want to make some introductions. My name is Megan. I'm going to be, I'm the B2B Marketing Associate here at Caring, and I'm going to be serving as the moderator for today's presentation. More importantly, I'm excited to introduce Kent Lewis, who is going to be here to talk to us today. He has a, a, a ton of experience in the industry and with digital marketing, and I will let you, Kent, um, share a little bit about yourself and your background with the group. Thank you so much uh, for uh, bringing me in today, Megan and Caring. It's always a pleasure to be a part of the group, and it's a pleasure to meet everybody virtually and one directionally, I guess. Uh, really good band if you're my age. Uh, so today we're going to talk about um, something that I that is near and dear to me, which is, uh, well, has been for many years, customer experience, uh, what you might in the industry call client experience. Uh, but what's interesting about my journey as an entrepreneur and a business owner in the digital marketing world for many years is that I learned the hard way that employee experience actually trumps customer experience. So uh, today's presentation is going to be, be about the idea of, for those of you interested in increasing your revenue, your profit, or your organization's valuation, or if you're just simply really in, uh, highly value your employees and are interested in, in, in retaining and engaging them, this presentation is for you. So let's talk a little bit about my obsession with customer experience that started more than 20 years ago. Uh, it was inspired by a local billionaire, uh, although when I read the book at the time, he was not. Uh, but Les Schwab opened his first tire store in the early 50s in central Oregon. And he was completely self-made, paid for school with uh, having the largest paper, paper route in central Oregon. He, he delivered all the papers, um, uh, left the house at 14 and became a self-made man after that. Uh, went to college, um, and after the war, started what is now, um, you know, 700 plus stores. Uh, he sold the business, long story short, in um, in the, you know, 2019, 2020 for over $3 billion. Um, his family did. He passed away in, 2000, um, in 2012. Uh, but be that as it may, he wrote a book way back in the early 80s about uh, his his passion for having a pride in, in, in his business. And what made him remarkable is that he transformed the tire business back in the 50s. They would run up to your car. They would, um, you know, bring you into a very clean, unusually clean shop. And they had coffee and popcorn while you waited if they repaired a flat or if they, um, you know, uh, replaced your tires. They added other things like brakes and other services over the years. Um, but Les Schwab, to me, his book about um, having a pride in the work uh, and creating a unique customer experience was inspiring to me. In fact, um, well, let me start with this quick story. They have been known to replace or repair flat tires for the last 50 years for free. It costs them roughly $10 million a year to repair flat. So just mainly the time. The rubber plug isn't a problem. The trick, though, with repairing a flat is 
the nail or screw or whatever instruction is that punctures a tire cannot be on the sidewall because there's too much of a safety or performance issue. But as long as it's on the flat part of the tire, they can plug it in about five minutes, take off the tire, plug it with rubber, reinflate it, reinstall it. And they do that for free because it's obviously a nice perk for current customers and a great leverage, uh, social, uh, social proof slash reciprocity uh, ploy to get potentially new customers who come in with a flat and, oh, you may need new tires. Think about us in the future. So that's one way to look at how they approach customer experience. And uh, I will talk more about this later. The other thing that makes them unique is that um, Les Schwab actually bought tons of acres in Central Oregon as he built his success and his wealth. And uh, one way to sell tires in the slowest month of the year, and believe me, I will tie this to senior care, senior living eventually, um, but uh, he would give away really expensive, great USDA prime beef once a year in March um, to anybody that bought a tire. So you might get the equivalent of today's dollar value, $50 of free beef. It was way more remarkable and interesting than getting $50 off tires, which anybody could offer. So people would wait until March to get new tires to get the really amazing beef. So not for the vegetarians, right? It would definitely appeal to meat eaters, but it became iconic. Everybody in the Pacific Northwest knows about the free beef deal at Les Schwab. Uh, unfortunately, I found out the hard way that ended in 2012 when, when he passed and new leadership took over and said, we're not doing this anymore. Um, mainly also because they sold the ranch, which is another factor. So, um, Again, 20 years ago, read this, this book, and my takeaway was about the customer experience and how it inspired me to build an agency, a digital marketing agency called Anvil Media back in 2000 to be one of the best in the business from the customer experience standpoint. Our clients were well taken care of, and that bode well for us um, over the next 22 years. In fact, uh, in fall of 2022, I wrote this article about creating the idea of creating a first-class experience, but... You don't have to be an airline, a premium airline to create a first class experience. It's a mindset. So again, inspired by Les Schwab and his tire businesses, he created a first class experience in the tire business. At best, it's a who cares industry. At worst, it's a miserable experience to get new tires, right? He made it painless, arguably fun, and certainly fed his customers well, at least once one month during the year. So that's my background. And let's talk a little bit about how that performs. So over the years, from 2002, I started hiring employees, um, getting out of the consultant world into a building an agency. Um, from 2002 to 2012-ish, I've you know won every award that, that I could in the industry and locally in business, um, a, built, a, a fast growing, well-respected, um, you know, with happy employees, but really happy clients. That was my focus. Delight the clients and everything takes care of itself. And that worked pretty well for about 10 years, a decade. I thought I was driving a Ferrari. Uh, unfortunately, I think I was a little bit wrong um, because in 2012, it all started, the wheels literally came off. So I was at a conference speaking in San Jose about online PR and digital marketing and SEO. And I sat down next to a senior, the head of digital and e-commerce for Home Depot. And it was like he was talking a different language. Keep in mind, I started doing search engine marketing in, in 1996, two years before Google was a search engine, publicly available search engine. So I was, you know, I'm OG. And here I am not understanding a new language. I was not keeping up in the changing dynamic landscape that is digital marketing. And so this is roughly March of 2012. And literally the day I get back to the office, the team tells me our Google reps had a meeting with us and told us we'll be out of business in the next two years if we don't change the way we manage our Google ads. So that was a wake up call coming from Google and my team and from potential clients or other industry pundits that we were not relevant. We'd been in the business almost too long to a fault and it was time to make a change. So turns out I wasn't driving a Ferrari, I was driving a Pinto. And if you know anything about Pintos, if you hit them from the rear end, they explode. At least that was a problem in the 70s. And so I felt like we weren't driving a Ferrari, we were driving a potentially highly explosive car. And you know, after a particularly bad day, uh, a year later, 
I was um, putting my oldest son to bed in the in the top bunk. My youngest son was was down below in the, in the lower bunk. And you know, let's say let's see, thirteen. He was probably he was probably you know eight or something at the time. And um, I, he just had to fall asleep with me next to him. And as I'm sitting, I'm staring at the ceiling. That's like a foot from my face. And I'm miserable. I had had a bad ex experience with a client that day. I felt like I, uh, I needed to fire a client before they fired me or an, an, another unhappy client I had to deal with. A client, uh, One of our employees had messed up something with a client in a, in a relatively rare case. We screwed up and I had to fix that. And I felt like if, if Google's telling us we're out of business, if I'm not understanding the language, if I'm out of touch and that my employees aren't performing the way they need to and my clients aren't happy, I need a reason to go back to work. I don't even want to work. And so I was pissed off. I was angry. I was frustrated with myself, not just with my team. I was I was certainly displeased with a few of my clients um, and that's the business. And I, if I'm getting upset with clients, I shouldn't be in the agency business, right? So I had all these, um, you know, word cloud feelings and I needed a solution to get me out of the, the out of this rut because I had to go back to work because it was my company. So I was inspired by Jerry Maguire, who I had just watched the movie with my sons the week before. I felt like I need that mission statement. Incidentally, the 28-page the manifesto that he wrote in the movie is available on the internet. 28 pages of righteousness that's worth a read if you want to Google it. Uh, but I felt like I needed my own mission statement. And so what I did is I developed what I ended up calling the Anvil Credo. Uh, you know, agency name was Anvil. And basically, it was 10... From 50 bullet points I wrote at 1 a.m. In a, in a day as I distilled it down to 10 truths. And I it was a box that allowed me to understand why I was going to work and why, uh, why others should go to work with me and that we were going to turn this company around and make it relevant. Um, unfortunately, uh, perhaps Akrita was a little too late or, uh, or whatever it was, but I learned in the next 12 months that I had had it backwards. Uh, really for almost a decade. And I was lucky that I had been so successful despite uh, having a, a, an incorrect view. So the famous Lee Iacocca said, I hire brighter people, sorry, I hire people brighter than me and then I get out of their way, right? Famous quote, right? Unfortunately, I, I took that too literally. I hired the best and brightest people I could. And then I knew, well, if they're smart, then I can just get out of their way and they'll do their jobs. Unfortunately, that didn't factor in. Um, I had very strong feelings on how the company should be run, their roles, um, what was needed to be successful. And we didn't always communicate that. The team may not have felt it was appropriate to come to me with their challenges, their problems. So we started to have a big problem because I was out of the way and they were some of my, even my best and most talented team members were absolutely flailing because we didn't have this uh, quote correctly figured out. I'll get back to it in a little bit on what my view of a modified Lee Iacocca quote should be. So within the first two weeks, uh, I realized that uh, I had created a magnet. So I attracted very few people. In fact, in the first two weeks, I gave, in fact, the team 72 hours, more or less, to agree and sign a piece of paper that was only the credo, which were those 10 bullet points. You can Google the Anvil credo and look it up for yourself. Uh, but the point was this. This, this team had been with me five to 10 years in the world of digital. They'd come out of college. I'd, we'd grown up together. And if you've ever watched Portlandia, it was a case of, I'm in my early mid thirties, it's time to retire. Keep in mind this 2012 peak Portland. And I couldn't get them to help me grow the company to the next level. So when I gave them the credo, they felt the game had been changed. That's my interpretation. And that magnet repelled half my team quit within two weeks, half my team. These are people, again, that had been with me years and they were deciding this new level of accountability, not interested. And so uh, what ended up happening is because I'm a PR guy, I went out and told the story. In fact, um, AdAge had a, a small business, small agency conference here in Portland. I stood up in, sport of, in front of 400 people and shared my story. I've had 85% employee turnover in the first three months after writing this credo. And it's been scary and it's been, um, but it's been the right move. So once the article related to that moment, um, what I call the Jerry Maguire moment, when I was in bed with my son and realized I need to make a change, 
um, the press, um, you know, a month or two later covered that story. Then the, the magnet reversed, the polarity reversed, and people started to come to me and say, I want to work at Anvil. I love the credo. It speaks to me. So while everybody else was exiting, new, amazing, inspired people were coming in the door. Unfortunately, if you know the aircraft carrier uh, metaphor, it takes something like seven miles for them to turn when they're at full speed. The momentum is, is incredible and they don't turn on dimes. So maybe it's two miles. I need to look that up, but it's miles. And that translates in business to years. We've been in business for over a decade before I decided to turn the ship radically in 2013, starting in roughly March. And again, by fall, 80, you know, we were, you know, 90% turnover within 12 months, we were hundred percent turnover. So um, on one hand, that Ferrari, and this is a uh, Le Mans Ferrari, one of five produced, completely wrecked and sold as is for over a million dollars. Why? Because it's a Ferrari and what you're buying is the chassis and the history. I felt like Anvil had a similar um, uh, prestigious background and history and pedigree that needed to be revisited instead of completely scrapped. And that's what I did. I started to rebuild the business in 2013 through 2019. And um, in March of 2019, I was about to sign the papers to sell Anvil Media, my agency, to another local agency. And I was at the car show. I'm a car guy here in Portland. And I ended up buying this car, realizing I'm out. I'm selling my agency. This isn't, by the way, a very expensive car. It's just a very lovely, amazing, fun car. Um, and so I, I bought this car. And two days later, after buying the car, I backed out of the deal. So I was I was I had enough foresight to realize I can afford this car whether or not I sell the business. And do I want it if I, if I don't sell the business? Absolutely. It's still in uh, the garage today. I still enjoy the car immensely. But the point is... Um, I thought I was out in 2019. I was not. But only three years later, after perfecting what I'm about to share with you today on creating a culture of caring, I increased the valuation of my agency with, in just in less than three years, 1.5x. So sale price in 2019 multiplied by 1.5, and that was the sale price three years later. That's a large multiple for really only fine tuning certain parts. It wasn't a massive revenue gain, it was stronger profit much stronger, stickier clients and a much stickier team. And that's what led to the increased valuation. My team was engaged and they were sticking around and they stuck around after the acquisition as well. So um, what I learned in my experience over really a 20 year period, 22 year period to be exact, was that fostering a culture of caring can dramatically increase profitability through greater employee intention, retention and engagement. So that's what I wanna share with you today. So this presentation is really designed for senior care executives and HR professionals within that within your industry that are in, really putting employee engagement and employee retention first and realizing that that has huge impact on the top and bottom line. So today I wanna to talk about for the remaining, remaining uh, you know, half hour or so, I wanna talk about defining what a culture of caring is and what it means, illustrating the return on investment in a culture of caring, and then get you started on your journey of fostering a culture of caring that will much will dramatically increase employee engagement and retention. And there is a halo effect to increasing uh, your client retention as well, as much as um, that can be a thing in senior care, right? Um, as long as they and their family are, are enjoying their time with you, you want, you want them to stay and not, and not go to a different facility or different partner. So let's start by defining a culture of caring. It's just really simply at the highest level, it's that you put your employees at the very top of your priority. Close second would be your customers, your clients, and then everybody else, the community. That can be your investors, your partners, your vendors, whoever else. But I had made the mistake of putting my clients above my employees and that led to my major challenges that took really six years to redirect and return that, uh, turn my, my aircraft carrier. So I'm trying to save you some of that pain. But let's let's dig down a little bit more on what actually a culture of caring is from, with a little more definition. So that's leading with um, basically um, it's purpose first. So uh, we've seen tons of research, Harvard Business Review, you name it, is that when employees have a sense of purpose, 
that their own interests and passions are tied to the purpose or mission of the organization, that they are far more engaged, they're far more productive, and they stick around. Um, and then that also translates into number two point is treating your colleagues as friends. So kindness, compassion, emotional, um, you know, that EQ, that emotional quotient. So having empathy is really important. And this is worth saying because I am not a highly empathic person. I'm a GSD kind of guy. And I lost some good people and one or two clients over the years because I was more I was more obsessed with justice and the, the right answer than reaching it in a collaborative, uh, empathetic way. So treating everybody as, as friends, um, as almost family, uh, dare I say, is, is very uh, productive. Um, the third element would be fostering social connections. So encouraging development uh, and meaningful relationships among the employees. I've been researching this the past year or so based on my 20 something years of being a business owner is that you can engineer culture to be more connecting, connective. Um, there's a business I know that literally paid their employees um, to meet with each other virtually or in person twice a month um, to get to know each other and specifically not talk about work. Uh, and it dramatically was when a merger, two different cultures came together and allowed them to meet. I think that's a brilliant idea and I would highly recommend that, which is why I'm doing that now. Um, we've already talked about empathy, but that's also uh, the communication style. Um, I think that we get comfortable when you're in a family, you don't always respectfully communicate with your, your parents or your siblings um, or your, sometimes your children. I can speak from experience there. And then going out of your way to provide that needed support that also builds trust and can increase productivity. So what's that extra mile of thoughtfulness? I, let me get that for you. Or I took the care of that for you. Or how can I help you is simply a great way to, to approach that. And then lastly, encourage your people to talk to leadership. Um, and it's because it's all about empowerment through training, um, which trumps operational best practices. So beyond prioritizing my clients, I also put more of an emphasis on process than on the people. And in the end, that hurt. Um, the connection, the connectivity, it, it hurt um, retention. It may have improved productivity, but the expense of retention and engagement. So it's all about training and mentorship over um, here's the process, here are the tools. I'll train you roughly how to use it. Good day. Uh, that's not going to be as successful based on the research and my own experience. So the easy way to look at it is something I learned. I've been a part of EO, Entrepreneur Organization, since 07. One of the first presentations I saw was by a guy named Jack Daly, who talked about corporate culture by default or design. And I was an agency guy all my career at 10 different agencies. I knew culture, you know, each strategy for lunch. And so it's all about the people. So I thought, but when I learned that that Southwest, outside of their, their technology snafus, um, Hey everyone, uh, it looks like Kent may have lost some internet access, so we will give him a minute to see if he comes back. But um, thank you for being patient here as we continue this presentation. So, Kent, are you there? 
I'm here. I'm so sorry. I just changed my wiring to go Wi-Fi. I don't know what's happening here. Um, are we good? Yeah, we are okay. good. Okay. I'll pick up where I left off and let me put my video back on. Um, or is it on? Can you see me? Yes. Okay. So Southwest Airlines, employees first, then customers. Customers take care of the business, right? So that is the approach. It's very simplified, but as, as a senior executives in a senior care facility, you take care of your employees, train them, and hire them in, with that sense of care and empathy to know, and I know this is pretty much a best practice, but hire the people inherently care for others and let them do their job and give them the structure and the training they need to be successful in their specific roles but then let them take care of the clients or the customers so that you can take care of running the business and the customers will, or clients will take care of you. So pretty simple approach. Um, so um, let's talk next about the calcula calculating the ROI of a culture of caring. So uh, I highly recommend for those of you in, um, in a role of managing people is to, and, and just executive leadership is to read Tiffany Bova's latest book, The Experience Mindset, she has done an absolute ton of research over her career about employee engagement and employee experience. And she has proven over the years that um, companies that with high investment in employee engagement have twice the revenue growth. Um, and that high employee engagement is linked to um, and the success is linked to employee experience, not customer experience. There is no correlation with customer experience. So the more you invest in customer experience, it might make it slightly better, but that doesn't have a long-term impact like investing in your employees. It's just st statistics. The numbers are there. Over 10 years, every dollar uh, that you invest in your employees over any other investment returns 80%. Now, that doesn't sound like um, it's not 100%. But it's just under that, meaning you're getting, you know, your money well worth that investment by putting the time into the employees over your customers or any other investment. Um, there's also a lot of other research that I've uh, found over the years. So the cost of high stress in company cultures, and I can tell you in senior care, senior living, there can be, dis despite it not being an ER, but if you have skilled nursing and other, um, you know, um, Alzheimer's or, or memory care, that it can be very stressful on employees because um, you know my my um, I've had family members with Alzheimer's, some with uh, my grandfather had a brain tumor, he, so he acted similar to um, an Alzheimer's patient. It was very stressful on everybody. So so how do you cope with that? Some numbers to keep in mind: five hundred billion is siphoned off of the U.S. economy every year due to workplace stress. 550 million workdays are lost each year due to stress. 80% of doctor visits due to stress. At one point, and I am imper I would like to think I'm impervious to stress being a business owner. 2012, super stress. 2013, a little less stress because I had a plan to fix my business. Um, after selling the business, 80 to 90% less stress. But I will tell you, I went to the doctor once because I had chest pains. It was all stress related. It was a family issue, not a business issue, but we're not impervious. Stress can be very powerful and very deadly. Um, and you can see that heart disease, there's a direct correlation between stress with your employees not getting their issues dealt with and heart disease. We don't want to be, as employers, contributing to people's early demise, right? Um, that's not good for business on either side, right? There's also the cost of disengaged employees, which is a profoundly, I had a small business. It was never bigger than 22 employees as an agency, uh, but in my sweet spot was around a dozen. That was the right size for me. Uh, but even then, I knew I had some disengaged employees. So how do you engage them? Because um, they have a 37% higher absenteeism, almost 50% more accidents, 60% more errors and defects. So they're making mistakes in your business, it can literally be the loss of a life. Potentially, it could be lawsuits. It can it can have a massive pancake effect. Sorry, pancakes. I must be hungry. Skip lunch. Um, but it, it has a snowball effect, a ripple effect, a butterfly effect that can be massively costly to your organization. If I miss optimize a website, nobody's going to die. But if if there's an issue with a patient that's um, ne neglected or misdiagnosed or whatever the case, you don't catch something and they pass and their family's not happy, that becomes a problem. So 
Um, other th other numbers to keep in mind, lower productivity, lower profitability, lower job growth, lower share price if you're publicly traded. Um, and even just re uh, replacing a single employee can cost 20%, up to 20% of that employee's salary. I've heard higher numbers, um, but that's kind of a good number to work with. It gets expensive. And your business with highly engaged employees have 100% more job satisfaction. It literally is night and day. So keep that in mind. So engagement is really important. So let's talk a little bit about how we can get started. Now, I grew up in the world of marketing, as I mentioned, you know, 10 agencies, 1,200 clients, including senior care, senior living clientele over the years. And one of the things that we always did at Anvil or our clients had done on their own through another agency or internally is map out the customer journey, right? From the... And yes, I just saw the written a note. You, the slides will be available after um, Karen will send those along. But journey mapping makes total sense. What's the customer? So I was a journey. I was a. I took the journey in the senior care, senior living space. When my my father had a very mild heart attack six years ago. Um, he was able to pick up the phone. I realized something was wrong immediately. Sent the ambulance within three months. He was went from critical care to. Um, to a transition recovery place, to a, um, a group home, and then back home within six months. He's 95% better, lost a little bit of vocabulary. He was lucky. But in those early months, I visited senior care facilities with, my, with and without my dad, and he was not interested in being with a bunch of old people. And he's in his early 80s, so I don't know who he had in mind, but he was determined to heal himself to avoid it. But I went through that customer journey, right up through tours, looked at some contracts and some pricing, we, we dodge that bullet for now, but it will be um, this this opportunity to be uh, re-engaging your industry is likely happening in the next five years. So customer journey mapping makes a whole lot of sense, but how many of you have done employee journey mapping, right? So mapping the employee's journey from that first time they hear about your facilities, your brand, whether you're Brookstone or somebody small, um, all the way to uh, the exit interview. Have you mapped out that journey? Probably not. So we'll talk about that. We'll also talk about um, uh, closing the loop, right? Making sure that you've got a communication cadence with your employees to maximize engagement and retention. So I'm suggesting, keep in mind, I do not sell, the most I sell, if I were to sell anything, and this is not a sales pitch, is I, I give some general directionality to some of my clients on this stuff, but I don't have a big product service set and workshops and ongoing consulting in this world. This is just me experiencing it and feeling the need and desire to share my experience with you and give you a framework so you can take this journey yourself to re re increase engagement, increase retention, which leads to greater profitability, greater revenue. So the place to get started is by auditing your employee's journey from that recruitment stage all the way through the exit, right? And the best way to do that is for senior uh, senior staff leadership executives is to become a, an undercover boss and look at each stage from the outside uh, looking in, even though you're in the inside looking out. But change your hat to being a junior, you know, a entry level, um, you know, caregiver, uh, kitchen facilities, custodial, um, you know, event activity coordinator, whatever it is. Look, go through that process as much as you can or have others do it um, and then report back because it, you, I've found that it's not as easy to use internal staff to, to do your own secret shopping. You really need outsiders to do it because they have an inherent bias internally. So you need to bring in outsiders or do it yourself. Um, worth a, dis in a discussion internally. So the the beyond once you've taken that journey what you do and i have one of my only two services i have is i've built a plan right it's like here's the framework and then just go do this yourself i don't do the audit um i just build you the framework and then you can go off and do it uh yourself um and then i there's some other things you can do but but the, but i have also a checklist of basically 100 touch points of an employee journey cuz not very many businesses nobody i've met so far has done this um, and I'm still asking if anybody has has done an employee journey uh, or a roadmap, let me know. Uh, but uh, the, it all starts and based on my experience and my success is build a roadmap. So every employee that's ever been at Anvil um, or has worked for me 
prior to that has had a, a what we call the IDP, an individual development plan. It was their roadmap while employed at my company or the company I worked for. And that seemed like second nature to me, like have a place, have a, have a agree on what's your short-term, mid-term and long-term goals. And where is your fit as you grow together? Hopefully you grow together, not grow apart. Although that may happen, at least you both are aware. It's no surprise. Um, and the reason I bring this up is I, as much as I, I touted these and had the team go through this process and, and report back weekly and, or monthly and quarterly on their progress, it wasn't until I became an employee after 22 years in March of 2022 that I realized how important this was because I never got a plan while I was there for 14 months uh, with the acquiring agency and I felt lost. I felt disconnected and eventually I left. So this the, having a roadmap for every employee is critical to retention because you it's an opportunity for alignment on long-term goals and fits, strengths, unique abilities, interests, and that all goes to, because most of the development is around skills and knowledge, which will happen no matter what, but it doesn't, it acknowledge, it, if you don't acknowledge strengths and interests or passions, then you've missed the opportunity in my mind. And then you back it out, starting with a weekly cadence. I did a written scorecard, just a quick little email with a little um, Excel that they would rate themselves on how they were performing against our core values. And then that would roll into a monthly, you know, highlights from the month came from the weekly updates. And then they'd also report on how they're working towards their quarterly goals and annual goals on a monthly basis. What progress have we made? S celebrating wins, um, discussing stucks. Um, those were 15 minute meetings. And then quarterly, um, we had one hour meetings where it's instead of annual reviews, we did quarterly reviews. At least we implemented that right as we were being acquired. So we didn't, I didn't get to, I don't get to share the returns with you of, of the ROI, but the interest was there is I can't course correct a human being once a year. So I'm not sure that you can either, no matter how good you think you are. So quarterly is a much better cadence to look at bigger um, personality, personnel, communication, performance issues. And then annually, you would have a 360 review feedback from, you know, from clients, from partners, from mainly coworkers, from other managers. How is this person performing? How are they meeting the goals or just the cultural fit? Maybe outsiders would re just review on a more simple general feedback, um, you know, qualitative versus quantitative. As a direct manager, you might focus on, on quantitative. But be that as it may, there's this weekly through annual cadence. And, and then the last component we'll share before we go to, to Q&A here is the idea of closing the loop. So um, according to research, a majority of employees, um, their trajectory at your organization is determined the first 90 days. Um, you know, I found that I was rarely wrong. Less than 5% of the time was I wrong about an employee after the first 90 days, meaning I knew they would make it or they didn't. And the people that I knew wouldn't make it and I kept them on because I didn't have enough talent in the world of digital marketing where there's no legitimate real certifications. And I've been an adjunct uh, at a local university for 20 years teaching this stuff, digital marketing, to try and find talent and help grow the industry. But I knew within 90 days, and, and I chose whether or not to manage them up or manage them out. Um, but the feedback from employees is if they don't get that training, the critical training they need, not only to do their job, but to succeed within the organization as a whole, they are not going to stick around. They're going to underperform, and they're going to get washed out. Instead of managing them up to fit in, that's the, the critical step. Um, another component is professional development. I had professional development budgets based on management levels. And I, I would say we had a 35% uptake in our best year of people utilizing their entire professional development budgets. And conversely, I might have people using 100% of their budget to go to a conference and give no value back to the organization. They just want to go to a certain city and hang around for a couple of days. And that doesn't work either. But I always encourage my team to maximize their professional development budget, whereas I know others weren't getting any. And, and that can be a sticking point. And uh, so retaining people helps when you give them the budget and the tools and the flexibility and a little trust to develop themselves. Recognition is obviously important. So creating enough structure that you have a weekly, monthly, quarterly, even annual cadence for kudos, sharing among company staff or team 
level meetings um, that roll up to, to leadership. So making sure as leaders that you are getting that information from the, the bottom up, from the custodians to the mid-level managers on up, that comes from also from the clients and the partners and vendors that are giving you that information. And then showing that you've received it, that you appreciate it, and you recognize those people for their accomplishments. Typically, best served if you tie it to your mission, vision, and core values. Um, so this person did this, and that's and because this is part of our mission, we want to recognize them. And also because it had this impact on the company, we're sending them to Disneyland, or they're getting a day off, or we, we sent them to a nice dinner, or whatever that is. It doesn't always have to be a perk. It can just be recognition. But um, stay interviews. This is a top 10, actually a top three recommendation is for those of you, and I wish I could do a quick show of hands, how many of you, you could click your raise hand, maybe, I don't know, have had stay interviews with employees? So you can go to PDX Mindshare, my networking site. I have a blog about what a stay interview is. Uh, but basically, you flip the script. It's not, let's talk about how happy we are with you and you, XYZ employee. It is, how happy are you with us? And what can we do to keep you happy and keep you here? And of the subtext is, of course, you want them to be happy because they will be engaged and more productive. Um, but instead of you telling them something, you're asking them for information that will thus make create more connection, alignment, and success. Stay interviews are transformative. I gave this presentation to a small group of entrepreneurs in San Jose. The next day, um, the head of an electrician company met with his two key employees. He said the stay interviews were transformative to the relationship. These were two longtime employees that were critical to the business. He had never had a stay interview. And we're asking them, what do you need to succeed? What can we do better? He said it transformed their relationship. And I would be surprised if they leave in the next five years. So that's um, that's kind of the core three, but I want to give you 10, 10 elements of a checklist. And again, you'll get a copy of this. And I have tons of links uh, related in the back of the deck when you get a copy. Um, or you can email me if um, you get the recording and not a hard copy of the deck to get the links. But it's important to start with day one, which is long before you ever get a resume, if you even get a resume, is what does your brand say when I Google your name? If I bring you know, a specific Brookdale location as an example, or um, one of my former clients, Escaton out of California, if I look at their brand overall, is it a place I want to work? If I look at a specific location near me, what are the Google reviews look like? What are the Indeed and Glassdoor reviews look like? So curating your, your presence online is critical. That's what I've been doing since 96 for clients, but it's something you probably have search marketing vendors um, if you have issues with employment issues or other lawsuits, you may need a PR firm. But the bottom line is you need to monitor reviews, respond to them, um, solicit ratings from happy employees, from happy clients. You know, this is, um, you know, I have a bunch of articles on this that you can take and run with it. Um, do you have a recruitment on your uh, video on your careers page that's that's the authentic voice of employees and your clients talking about the employees? Uh, beyond, you know, just general benefits and job descriptions. Are you selling your brand effectively with a, a really good careers page? You've just inspired me. I'm going to put an article together on what's what makes a great career page. Um, you can look at the anvilmediainc.com career page as a, as a small business starter um, comparison, but I think I'll put an article together for PDX Mindshare here momentarily. Um, welcome package. This is huge. On the first day of work, when they show up, do you have some, a, a welcome package? Now, I'm, I'm from the white collar knowledge worker economy where they're gonna obviously have a, a laptop, but for any employee at any level, is there a shirt or a coffee mug or some sort of swag? Is there a nice little, you know, some snacks, some candies, um, a little gift card to the local Starbucks? You know, um, you know, branded swag is a no brainer, but are there other little things to make their days a little easier with, you know, feel like you're celebrating them on their first day with, with a little swag bag, a little gift bag? Um, and then critical meetings, the first 90 days of onboarding, are they meeting with coworkers, managers, leadership, you know, customers, like what is our clients, what is your um, approach to having them, integrating them in um, to the brand and to your culture? Um, I think within, within 60, no later than 90 days, you want to have developed the framework for a career roadmap and at least introduce the idea. Um, I think it's important that they know that you care about their long-term fit in the organization, that they should be thinking about it from day one, but I would put more effort into really 
honing it around around you know 90 days when the kind of the trial period's over. Buddy systems can be effective. Do you have a buddy system? Do new employees, are they paired with senior employees so that they can kind of help guide them through the, the quirks and the unwritten rules? And there's the quarterly reviews versus annual reviews. Those are important. And getting 360 feedback from other employees, you want to try to avoid, of course, the problem of people helping each other and giving each other positive reviews. You want to get enough reviews so you get a real good feel. And then having some sort of ability for the even the lowest level employee to meet with the highest level leadership within that facility or within the organization to get a sense of connectivity. Leaders that are connected to their employees are more effective. Employees that are connected with their leaders are better engaged and more productive. And then last but not least, I mentioned earlier, schedule stay interviews. I recommend if you're still stuck on annual reviews, um, six months apart, you have a stay interview, then an annual review, and if you're doing quarterly reviews, have one of those be a stay interview or modify your quarterly reviews to have two to three questions related to stay the stay mindset. Here's the feedback we wanna give you. What feedback do you wanna give us? No reason that the stay interview is a one-time deal and it doesn't have to be an annual deal. I think it's as needed as frequently as quarterly. So those are my recommendations based on my experience. And I've also modified the Lee Iacocca quote, um, I hire people much smarter than me, and then we grow the business together um, as a team. So I don't get out of their way. I'm. That's not to say I'm holding hands with them. That's you know we can't do that these days. We get canceled, but we are walking in lockstep together towards our goals, helping each other throughout the way. Them, the employees giving me critical feedback, whether I want to hear it or not, I need to hear it, and me giving them coachable mentorship moments. Um, and instead of just assuming they have all the right answers and don't letting th not letting them be afraid of failing, celebrating failure when you w learn from it. Otherwise, it is a true failure. So, um, again, to recap from 2013 or when I, you know, blew up my company, rebuilt it through 2018, 19, we had we 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 accomplished a lot getting the company to where it was a much better place in 2019, where there was a, a high valuation and I was in a happy place thinking I'll just sell. But when that, I decided to pull the plug, I realized there was more work I needed to do to get us to a full employee first, employee centric, uh, employee experience. And that made work more fun for me, more fun for my employees and for my clients. And in the end, that led to a 1.5x increase in our valuation and, uh, and, and it was transformative. So what did we cover today? We talked about the idea of what is a culture of caring by definition? What is the return on investment in investing in your employees over anything else? And the first steps to get started, start with mapping the employee journey and then moving towards um, building more communication cadence and acknowledgement and stay interviews and quarterly reviews to create that critical connection that increases engagement, increases retention, and will absolutely improve your productivity, your profitability, and your top line revenue. So we have a bunch of, I have a bunch of links here. I've been building this out over the last year or so based on my experience and a ton of research. Um, so we'll get you a copy of this presentation and this recording. Uh, and there's two other books I recommend. Uh, one is a restaurateur from the Pacific Northwest, or actually maybe it's from California, but um, he had a, a, a restaurant called Farrell's. I grew up, you'd go to get dessert there and big Sunday for your birthday. And his book, Give Him the Pickle, is the idea of no matter what your customer wants, you give it to them. And that's from a restaurateur. And the other is hospitality. Horst Schultz is a co-founder of Ritz-Carlton and talks about that first class mindset totally inspired me to write that article. Um, this was a book club book. We read it when I was um, at my former employer and I thought it was very inspiring and I highly recommend those. And before we go to questions, I wanna leave you with this story. I have my own Les Schwab story. Um, and in 2012, it happened to be March. I was, drove to work and as I got out of the car, I looked down at my tire and I realized, oh my gosh, it's, it's, it's low, it's losing air. So luckily there was only five blocks away, six blocks, there was a Les Schwab. I drove there and I said, listen, I've got a, a flat tire and I know you can, you'll fix it for free, right? And um, the woman said, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, if we can fix it, we will fix it. But um, let me take a look and it'll just take 10 minutes. They happened to have an open bay, pulled it in, 
I'm waiting there, drinking my coffee, snack, snacking on popcorn. She comes in she, after, exactly 10 minutes later. And she said, unfortunately, the, the sidewall is punctured. So you're going to need new tires. Uh, the good news is that your all your tires are worn. So, you know, th it's not a bad investment. Just having one flat, you really do need to replace your tires. Now, I drive a BMW. The tires are expensive, um, well over $1,000. That was not expense I had planned that day. So I jokingly said, hey, can I get some free beef with these tires that I'm not planning to, wasn't planning to buy this morning? She said, well, we sold the, the ranch. We don't offer the free beef anymore. I was like, Ugh, can I get like a pack of M&Ms, something? anything because this is a huge expense for me and she said come back in two hours we'll you know we'll take care of you so uh this is carol she, she well this is an a, you know a version of carol that that uh, took care of me uh, this is how they dress and uh, she said uh, she called me up said the car is ready come by and pick it up so i go in she wasn't there uh, different uh, service rep gave me the keys i go into my car to start the car, I mentioned the free beef already, and there's a pack of M&Ms on the dashboard. I was like, oh, that's interesting. Wait a sec. I said that as a joke because there was no free beef. And, and here are their pack of M&Ms. So I immediately get out of the car. I run back in and I'm looking for Carol. Um, you know, she was on break when I went to pick up the car. And I realized, wait a sec. She probably just went to the vending machine. I go over to the vending machine. No M&Ms in stock. I was like, hmm, so she actually went to the store? I don't know, I'm confused. At that moment, she walked back in off break. I said, did you get me these M&Ms? Like, were they here? She's like, no, I just went down the, the two blocks down to the store, it's no big deal. I said, why did you do that? She said, this is, you know, management takes care of us so that we can take care of you. This is who we are, this is what we do. And I was extremely inspired. And this happened over 10 years ago, and I still tell this story all the time. It's the power of when management takes care of, of employees, amazing things can happen. So that's my journey from favoring employee, um, understanding the power of employee experience can trump customer experience. Both are important, but one has a direct correlation with um, high retention, engagement, and profitability. So I'm happy to open it up to Q&A in the last few minutes here. Oh, and you can always email me with questions um, uh, about the presentation or any supporting services. If you have any questions, I can direct you uh, to some resources. Well, this was incredible. Thank you, Kent. This was uh, definitely a lot of really great information. I don't see any questions from anybody. I'll give another moment or so to see if anybody wants to throw a question in there but Kent's information his email his website is in the slide deck you can kind of take a screenshot now we will also be sending out the deck the deck and the recording today will be available to you within the next couple of days and yeah I want to thank you all for attending today's presentation at the, um, at the end of the presentation, there is a survey. We would love for you to fill it out. Let us know what you want to hear from, what kind of information we could be providing you. And you can reach out to us. And, oh, I actually do see yeah. one question here. If you want to go ahead and I take see that, that one. Yes, uh, Peter. So I saw your question. How do you balance employee engagement with accountability? So I, I love that question because that was the rut I was in from 2002 to 2012 was um, these people can take care of themselves. They don't, you know, um, and and they'll take care of the clients too. And I take care of the clients and I'll take care of them. And so the problem was that I did not, um, I did not hold my team accountable for their actions. And the reason I blew up the company and created the credo was the credo, why, sorry, why everybody left eventually was the old anvil. I was getting calls all day long and emails. I did not need to do any marketing to get digital marketing clients. But by 2011 and 12, that changed where my team was losing clients faster than I could replace them. They had had no accountability. So when I held them to task and said, you are now accountable, that is the credo. They decided I'm going to go get a job Portlandia style somewhere else where I'm not as hell. I don't have the accountability. Um, that's my narcissist. That's my narrow view of it oversimplified. In reality, I had a set of rules that they thrived under, and then I changed the rules and they didn't want to play with those rules. So I believe these are directly correlated in a positive way that the more you hold the team accountable, but give them the tools to succeed and the feedback loops, 
they will be more engaged and they will embrace the accountability. Um, I learned 10 years ago that I was misusing the term millennial mindset as an age, not a mindset. So once I separated out my millennial age employees from a mindset, if you think of all the negative connotations, everything transformed. I realized I had both um, Gen X and millennial aged people that had a wonderful mindset of accountability, as you said, and they were fully engaged. And then I had others that were Gen X age or Gen Y age that had a total BS mindset, you know, that I'm here to serve them. They're not necessarily here. They're here for the money. They're not here for the clients um, or, or, you know, to better the company. So I think what you do is um, the balance is that they are inextricably linked. So you, you focus on upfront with every employee, set the get the boundaries of, of accountability for the role. And then when you agree on that and have a roadmap for the long term, then engagement naturally happens. Otherwise, right at the start, when they're saying, I'm not going to be accountable to these things, I'm not going to agree, then you know they won't be engaged and therefore you can you can um, manage them up or out. Hopefully that helped. Okay, well... That about wraps everything up. If you have any additional questions, you can feel free to reach out directly to caring.com or directly to Kent. And we are happy to uh, kind of submit, kind of follow up with anybody individually if they have any questions. As I mentioned, there will be a survey after this. We would love to hear your feedback on this. There are also more resources on our on our page, on our website, partners.caring.com and on our LinkedIn page as well. And with that, I want to let everybody go back to your day of helping seniors. And I hope you have a great day.